I'm Terry David Mulligan, and this is uh, Mulligan Stew on the CK Way Radio Network. As you well know, we follow and have followed Holger Peterson's Natural Blues for 26 years. He's been doing that show for 115 years. And um, uh, and uh, I, as I was telling Duke Robillard, Duke is, is with me here on, on camera with Zoom and, and on audio. Um, uh, uh, how do I follow a show like what Holger does, he just lays it all out. It's the blues. Here's here's what it is. Step in, and I'll take you for a two hour ride. So, I try to find the uh, the through line between the blues that he's playing and the rock blues, rhythm blues that I want to play to to get to the show at seven o'clock uh, and with Lionel. And so, uh, you are you are the guy that takes me from one show to another, and I appreciate that very much. Nice to have you on the show. Glad to be of help. <laughs> nice to be here with you. How did you handle the uh, two years away from touring, playing, um, uh, having to hunker down? Did, were you okay? I mean, did you go stir crazy or what? Well, I did go stir crazy, but I was lucky that just when COVID was coming on, I decided I was uh, going to do an album. And so we back really rushed right into the studio and did a blues album called Blues Bash. Yeah. So that that at least I had something out during the beginning period of that. And then the, the second year, last year, I uh, things were getting a little bit better, but we were still very weary of COVID. So. We went in and did our, our new album. They called it Rhythm and Blues. And we just wore masks and performed in different rooms. And, you know, we did it in the studio. But, uh, well, a few of our guests uh, did their parts where they live. But but for most of it, we did it live. But we tried to, we, we luckily were in a really big space. So we were able to stay away from each other pretty much and not get sick you know but so. nothing really replaces being in the same room playing together right well that's true actually we were in the same room uh most of us a lot of the time but it was a big enough room that sure. we could be feel you know safe um the uh, the title uh, interests me uh, one of the words in the title interests me they called it rhythm and blues uh, um it it it, it implies that there's no longer rhythm of blues. Like it's a, it's a past tense. Uh, tell me about the is in there. Tell me what they, they called it. Yes. Rhythm of blues. Well, that was done very, very intentionally because, you know, the umbrella of what is called rhythm and blues now is so wide that yeah. it really is disconnected. And what I've been championing and loving and playing uh, some of my entire life has been the original form of rhythm and blues, which grow, grew out of the swing era uh, with horn sections and horns and was, the, was basically basic barroom blues, but classed up a bit with horns and jazz-like solos. Yep. And the... That style of, of music was really only about a 10 year period that it was really popular. Are you talking about from 46 to 52, 53, that jump blues that, period? Yeah, yeah, yeah man, that right was in magic. there. Yeah. That was magic. That's my favorite period of blues in a sense, because when I first heard say the Buddy Johnson Orchestra, I went, listen to this band, it's a full big band. They have great arrangements. They have phenomenal horn soloists. They have several different singers in the band. It's blues. It's total blues, but it's got a few more chords to it. It's got really danceable arrangements with, with great soloists. And it just seemed to have all the elements of what I thought was great about blues. You know, and I, it just and, kind of expanded and, it a little. And when they took it out, Duke, as you well know, they put on a show. It was a show. Yeah, absolutely. Full, full tilt. You know, I guess Cap Calloway reflected it with that with that white tux. That's what I kept. That, that's captured in my mind. But it was more than that. For example, um, "Eat Where You Slept Last Night." That track, 
Who is Zuzu Boland? Zuzu Boland was a uh, a Texas legendary blues guitar player, singer, songwriter. And um, that particular track was his one, I think, I believe one sort of hit record, at least a regional hit record. Sure. And uh, he was very infamous and uh, uh, I believe kind of out of the scene and they, they kind of found him and, and, and around Houston uh, started, you know, um, little blues bands would start uh, backing him up and doing shows with him. And they called me down. Actually, Zuzu called me himself early one Sunday morning, woke me up <laughs> and, and <laughs> asked me to come down and make a record with him. Because as he said, because, Duke, you're the onlyest guy I know in a place <laughs> like that. So I said, "How? what can you say to that? I got to go down and play with Zuzu Zumbo. And, and we we made a really nice album. And it, it's good because it uh, reinstated the fact that he existed, you know, and, and uh, but w on a worldwide level. Not that it was a monstrous seller. I have no idea how it sold, but it did make him visible as one of the pioneers of Texas rhythm and blues. You were talking about uh, while we're at that juncture, Duke Grovelard, um, uh, you're talking about uh, what's 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 happened to rhythm, the term rhythm and blues. Um, I was looking at the best contemporary blues at the Grammys, which are coming up Sunday. Yep. Uh, fantastic Negrito. Uh, Geneva Magnus, Kenny Neal, record company, Joe Lewis Walker. Um, yeah, where do you do you do you fit in that contemporary? I mean, you do, I know, because you keep jumping from field to field. you uh, where is your home? Well, the truth is, is that all <laughs> the styles that I have played are all a real part of me. Um, I grew up, I learned to play from Chuck Berry and Dwayne Eddy and Little Richard and uh, Buddy Holly and people like that. So I grew up with early rock and roll. I was growing up as that, I was like seven as those kind of records were just uh, becoming popular in 1954, 55, you know? And so I, and my brother was 10 years older than me and had all the 45s of all the great rock and roll records. So, you know, I, I was just there and, and, you know, he had a guitar and I wasn't allowed to play it. But when he was out on a date or at football practice, because he was 10 years older than me, I was seven and he's out. Yeah, you know, man. 17 and he's out on a date or playing football or something i'm in his room teaching myself to play guitar you know and for some reason nobody in my family ever believed i had any musical talent when i was really <laughs> young and my mother was totally annoyed by the fact that i wanted to play electric guitar because the year i started bugging her about it you know elvis presley little richard all the the guys that were kind of wild on stage would come on television. It was early, the beginning of television too, really. But, you know, you, she'd see people like that on TV and she'd go, oh no, my son is not doing that, you know? So, but I said, but this is what I'm born to do. You know, I knew that when I was six, I knew that playing music what I, is what I was meant to do. And I didn't have interest in anything else. Plus I got asthma, so I couldn't play sports. So, you know, uh, so, you know, uh, all of these people led to, Chuck Berry had led to blues because the flip sides of two of his records, <coughs> excuse me, two of his records uh, flip sides were slow blues. And the Wee Wee Hours was the yeah. flip side of his, his first record, Maybelline. And that record affected me heavily at, at like seven years old, listening to that. And I'd go, what is that? That mood, it just puts you in this mood. And I could tell at seven, you know, that's where I wanted to be. Is that I've never heard anything like this. I never felt like this. I'm getting goosebumps and, yeah. you know, I don't know what's <laughs> coming over me, you know? So I became an addict, just, you know? We live, in the, we live in the same vacuum, you and I. Um, uh, I was listening to Wolfman Jack, and oh, he was yeah. playing. 
he was playing stuff, XERB, Del Rio, Texas. He was playing stuff that I just had never heard before. And I was up till midnight at one o'clock in the morning under the covers, listening to this, thinking, who is this guy? And, and, and the and transistor was radio, right? Huh? Transistor radio. Well, no, actually, I, I, I took the cover off my radio and laid my alarm on one of the wires. And it became the ground for the, and all of a sudden I could pick it up. I don't know how it happened, but it happened. <laughs> It That's was a great story. Things and, like that um, don't happen anymore. And right? I just realized I was listening to music that nobody else was picking up on. And one of the reasons why I thought Jump Blues was so cool, 46 to 54, 55, two things. They were, everybody was celebrating the fact that they survived a world war and they got out. That's And they that's were suffering true. the right, it was, it was a whole new life. Let's reinvent ourselves. What do you want to do? And the second thing is somewhere in there was rock and roll. Maybe it was the fat man out of out of Norway, whoever, whatever. But somewhere in there was rock and roll, and it just flowed out. Yeah, that's true. That's absolutely how it happened. And, it and had I to- never, re- I never recognized when I was young the difference between the rock and roll, the blues, even big band blues songs like yeah. well, like Glenn Miller's uh, "In the Mood" was is basically a 12 bar blues certain sections on sections aren't but that repeating riff thing that was a main structure of early rhythm blues like the blues riff repeated and you know just changing a few notes to to mash the chords and that kind of shout thing kansas city count Basie, all that How about illinois jacket oh yeah Oh man, the main element in jazz the- at the Philharmonic, and and you're right, Count Basie, Kansas City, the whole the whole uh, you know cutting contests in Kansas City stages, guys going from stage to stage. But what a time to be around and listening and and, and digging it, and that's why. Well, you know, I never got past that period. I mean, of course, I listen to contemporary music somewhat, and I I was in the in the game as far as the 1980s uh you know competing with other bands making recordings playing kind of blues influenced rock and roll in that period of time you know and i I still play some of that music i still write it occasionally and you know but that that's really jump blues period that's where i live you know i've got 7078s in my basement you can find me down there most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I just moved. I, I totally identify with it. Um, I have just rediscovered a John Hammond's Wicked Grin album that he did with uh, Tom Waits. Oh, what a great record. Incredible album. And I'm, I'd love to see that John Hammond's here with Homeless Blues. It was the first track I played off the album. Just, uh, how right. did it come together? Well, John and I go way back. We met in the 70s on Block Island in Rhode Island, where he had uh, some relatives uh, living, and he was out there visiting him. And I was playing Block Island Inn with Roomful of Blues when we were just starting out. And John came out to hear us, and he flipped over us, you know. And we spent the first night we met, we spent sitting in my hotel room talking about Robert Johnson and Sunhouse and howling wolf and everybody you know just all night you know and we've been really good friends ever since then so and we've backed john up a lot my my band we've done tours where john's played solo and then we play and then he comes out and finishes the night with us so we're we're very close you know we're admirers of each other and good friends and uh it, you know, it was just the natural. I just called him up and said, "Hey, John, you want to guest on my album?" And he said, "Of course." You know. <laughs> and you and Kim Wilson have known each other a long time. Of course, yes. But when when they first came, the Thunderbirds first came up before they had any records out or anybody knew them. The very first time they came up to Boston, we were playing in Boston, and they came out and saw us, and they were playing the next night in Boston. So we came up from Providence and, and went to their gig and we, we all became really good friends. In fact, I talked to Jimmy Vaughn about 15 minutes ago. He had called me. He's uh, up in the area touring now. Um, did you meet Wolf? Colin, Colin Wolf? 
oh yeah, I got to open for him uh, two or three times, and and uh, I didn't know him real well. I was a really shy kid, you know, for uh, not even as an uh, an adult, I was pretty shy for a long time. So I met and backed up all of the guys. They were all alive, and all the you know, BB and uh, uh, Freddie King and uh, Wolf and Muddy and uh johnny shines uh george yeah. uh george monica smith you know all everybody was still alive then so i got to play with all of them i was really so lucky i just so lucky. i knew how lucky i was but i i never thought about looking back and saying all those guys are gone and i played with the cream of all of them you know it's uh, a are, pretty amazing thing let, let me do this then this is a duke robelard uh no place to go written by Chester Burnett Holland Wolf from the album. They called it Rhythm and Blues. All right. It's the uh, Duke Robillard band. They called it Rhythm and Blues is the name of the album, his latest. You have no idea how many albums you have now, do you? Uh, I think I have 37, I think, <laughs> in total, <laughs> that are under my name, and then many with other people in his side you, band. You, know. you are consistent. Uh, it's just astonishing, the output from you. <laughs> it it kind of is. It's it's funny. Like every year, if I usually every winter I make an album because things are slower and and if I don't do it now, I've done it so much that I just feel like something's very wrong if I don't make an album in the winter. Is it fair to say that it was a great fit and a and a opportune opportunity uh, for Stony Plain and Holger Peterson to come along and partner with you? Oh, absolutely. Are you kidding? It's been like, it, I don't think my career would probably still be going. I probably still wouldn't be recording if it wasn't for Holder because he, you know, he just really believed in all the things that I could do and, and he allowed me to do them and sure. follow my own news, you know, and it, it really made a big difference in my life. So describe, by the way, we don't know, we don't know the real Holger Peterson. We only know the guy that's on the radio. Um, describe um, Holger Peterson as the executive producer. Is he like a Phil Spector walking around, smashing things, throwing stuff? Uh, uh. <laughs> no, as executive producer, basically that means that he, you know, gives me the go ahead to to make the record and funds to make the record. And sometimes we discuss, you know, the direction or the material. He, I ask him for advice yep. often, and. Um, you know, but the thing is, is that his enthusiasm, genuine love and enthusiasm. I, I, the only guys I could think of that that I that I've met that I know of that might be in the same category as him would be um, Tom Dowd and Jerry Wexler. Wow. You know how they were such fans of the music. Wow. Like Jerry Wexler, when I met him. When he first heard Room Full of Blues, he took me out that night and him and Tom Dowd took me up to the room that used to be the original recording studio uh, for Atlantic in the early days when they just made those blues records and R&B records, you know, and, you know, he, Holger is that type of person, you know, but even more of a fan in a way of music. I shouldn't say that because those guys are really fans of music, but, but Holger is like, you know, he, you can just, he wears his heart on his sleeve yeah. as far as yeah. music, you know. Neil Corbillard's joining me here on Mulligan Stew. Um, and um, I'm looking at a couple of things here. First of all, um, tour dates. Uh, where are you? Oh, uh, April 9, West Yarmouth. So you kick it off April 9. And then I see June, June the 4th, you're in Italy, in Piedmont. In Piedmont. Yes, yes. Have mercy. Yeah, that should be a lot of fun. Actually, I'm going over there with Sugar Ray and the Blue Tones. It's, it's Sugar Ray's band, and I'm uh, going over as guitarist for that. You know, we do quite a bit of work together. He, Ray was just, uh, Sugar Ray Norcia, I'm talking about. He was just on our uh, two, um, the last week on our two CD release shows we had. And, uh, um, and, Fall River Mass and Natick Mass. Um, there were 
really well attended, great shows. And we had Ray and Michelle Wilson as uh, guests on it. And actually, Ronnie Earl even came out on the second night and, and <laughs> sat in with us. And, mm -hmm. So it was like old times. Do you know what the summer is going to look like? Well, we have dates. We still have a lot of dates coming in. And uh, uh, I, I'm also in the kind of in the middle of making some business changes. So, uh, but we do have quite a few few dates and, and I'm sure there's gonna be quite a few more. Now that the album is out and getting so much attention, it's getting a lot of attention and it's, you know, uh, ranking high up on the- do you, do you know why album. it is? Duke, do you know why it is? Well, because so many great musicians are on it. <laughs> uh, well, there's that, but but it strikes a chord. It's, it, yes. it's it, it, it's time is perfect. And as you well know, as we've learned over the years, many things in our lives are cyclical. You know, we dismissed vinyl. Here we are back again. Vinyl is outselling CDs. We're right. The CDs and somehow it'll, everything is cyclical. And, and you have brought back rhythm and blues, the real rhythm and blues at a time when we really need that. I, I, well, feeling, I think that same feeling that those, young people felt after world war ii that they had survived it this is the same wow, thing. You know, that's a great theory that's a really great theory because after this pandemic and also with you know potential nuclear war it, it actually looming in the distance uh it, you know it has been a really dark time and the real rhythm and blues is the most fun music it's because it's made to dance, it's made, made to listen to, it's made to drink to, it's just made to have a good time. That's what it's all about. Well done. Um, how's the book going? It's going slow because I've been busy doing other things, you know, uh, gigging and recording and painting. And, and, but, I, but I do have quite a lot of it done. And I need to get back to it soon and just get it finished. You know, is it your whole life? Hopefully, or just, find a publisher. Is it, is it about your whole life or just a period in your life? No, it's about actually my my entire life. It's about starting from my first memory that I have is being in diapers on the kitchen floor listening to big band music on the radio. <laughs> I can remember that far back. I, I, I don't know if everybody remembers that far back, but have I have any photos. Few. Any photos of that? And, well, it's photos of me being young. I don't, not, not particularly um, of that. But. You mentioned a documentary on your uh, fan page. Um, what's, what's going on with the documentary? Well, I have a, 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 uh, producer who is uh who's done a few really good documentaries one on ricky jay the the uh, sleight of hand artist he's like yep. an old school he he's done a documentary on him and he's done one on uh oh, what is his name uh wizard of the strings what's what's his name i can't think of his name at the moment but in 1920s Guitarist who played ukulele, guitar, banjos, steel guitar. Um, Roy, uh, Roy, Smith. Reason, Roy Smith. Roy Smith. That's him. That's him. Yeah, he did a great documentary on him uh, many years ago. So we're, we're talking and we're looking for funding because, of course, you have to have funding to get that done. Yeah. But uh, I, it started off with uh, someone who had uh, use of really good um uh, film equipment and did an interview with several local artists here and I was one of them and I was just really at that time working on my book so I had all my memories of the you know my uh, my uh, career really fresh in my mind so they did an interview and I, and I just kept going I just I you know it was just a good day for me to be filmed so that is kind of like the basic starting point of the documentary so duke did you say 30s around 37 albums of my own yes, yes. so what's the box set going to look like Ooh, that well the box set is going to be stony plain okay. it, um you know because it's very hard to get all these different labels to work together that way or somebody's going to put up money but 
on just in the last 20 years alone of my Stony Plain recordings, I have a, an incredible album of one would be of very traditional blues and R&B. One would be of original, more blues rock oriented material. Yeah. And the third one would be of swing, uh, oh, swing yeah. style guitar, because I've done a lot of that and I've done quite a bit of that for Stony Plain also. So between all of that, I could have a full album of, uh, of all three of those genres. And I'm hoping they let me do it. You know, I'm pretty sure Holger is is into it. You know, we haven't talked about the Canadian on the on the list here, Sue Foley. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sue's great. And I've watched her develop since she first came down to Texas. You know, I, it was around the time I was uh, playing a lot with the Thunderbirds and playing in Austin a lot. So, um so I got to know her and watch her grow and, you know, such a fantastic guitarist. And, and uh, you know, when I asked her if she would guest on this record, she, you know, said immediately yes and was really helpful. We even got somebody to do her part of our video because we have a video together of one of the songs. And, and she found a, a good person to uh, film her part of the video okay. down there. So who picked the uh, Mickey and Sylvia song? I picked that, Jim, Atta because boy. it's a song I always loved and always thought I should do it with somebody. And then when this this came up, I went, wow, this, I think this is the perfect song for us to do together. And it really turned out good. No Good Lover. Yeah, great song. Which one did you do the video for? Uh, no Good Lover. No good Lover. Thank you. All right, so we're going to do this. We're going to play this, and we're going to show you the... Uh, we have the uh, video on the Mulligan Stew website. This is Duke Robillard from They Call It Rhythm and Blues, the Duke Robillard band. All right, I know I have to leave. Uh, I have to go away now because you've got things to do and and um, other interviews and and, uh, and people want to make a fuss. Um, <laughs> but I mean, uh, it, here's the weird thing about this album. As soon as I saw the title, they called it Rhythm and Blues. I knew it was going to be. I just knew it was going to be good. My gut told me that you had landed dead center where I live and prom and very likely where you live from time to time. And I thought, well, that's pretty much where I live all the time. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and you're going to do right by it. You're going to honor it. You're not just going to cover these songs. You're going to live it. You've lived it. You're going to, you're going to tell the tale. Well, that's what we tried to do. And it certainly felt right doing it. So, and the world seems to agree now. So I'm very, nice. very happy. So I guess a year from now, when we do this interview, you'll be headed for the Grammys. Then. You know, people have mentioned that, and I wouldn't be surprised if it happened. But you never know, because there's certainly a lot of politics that go into that well, type of thing. You know. And we also have to survive the year. Uh, is that your art behind you? Okay. Actually, it is. Yes. Yes. It's, uh, my wife changed the color of this room. And um, uh, Minnie, that's my dog, Minnie. Um, it's only the mailman, Minnie. Uh, <laughs> so, so this is, uh, it matches the colors in the room. You know, I just did an abstract uh, that, that would be large and have all the colors that fit the room. Have you done a show? Have you, do you sell? Oh, yeah. I, uh, I've done, I think about three now, uh, different ones. To have a show actually at the place that we played for our first night of our um, CD release party, the Narrows in Fall River, Mass. I have an entire wall covered with my art, so I, we decided to make it a a, a to, total Duke thing, and you know, have art and music, you know. So that's kind of cool. And also, uh, uh, Jeff Kulowak at um, uh, I forgot what his uh, the the artist uh, um, place the art place he has has all musicians artwork. He's got one of, a couple of my pieces that are you know he's got Dylan's art, Neil Young, and 
Joni Mitchell and all the people that that there's some not known and some known of artists that that do visual art also. Jo, jo, in this move that we did, uh, I discovered a Joni Mitchell interview that I'd completely forgotten I'd done uh, for television, and so it was the podcast. And then and you'll be you'll be following. Uh, last last thought. No, it isn't the last thought, but I, you just reminded me of something. Um, uh, you and Colin Linden have something in common in that, uh, for, first of all, you're great guitarists and producers and songwriters, um, but you both played with Dylan on stage. It's not, it's not, it's, it's never going to be a, a pride and joy thing. It's going to, you, it's a very workmanlike thing. I mean, everybody has to be on their best work. What was that experience like for you? Oh, well, it was everything it could be. It, it, it was great. It was great recording with him. Uh, I was on the Time Out of Mind album. Working with him live was mostly great, uh, except for there were there were nights when all of a sudden what he liked before he didn't like now, and I <laughs> nobody knows how to change it because you can't read his mind, you know. So, but it was a great experience, and I was very very happy to have done it. And his <clears throat> his legacy. What is, what's his legacy, do you think? Oh, God. Are you kidding? Like, his legacy is America from 1960 on, you know? I mean, that's his legacy, you know? Well, that's why I'm talking to you, because it's your legacy I wanted to honor here. Well, thank you. Get that thank damn doc much. done. Get the book done. Uh, I'll go and tour. I'm glad you're telling me to do that, because I need <laughs> to be told. <laughs> Thank you, Duke Robillard. Thank you for uh, being on uh, Mulligan Stew. And um, and thank you, Holger Peterson, for uh, for um, giving this man a stage upon which to play. And you've take, took, taken advantage of it. Well done. And I'm honored to uh, have you on the show and finally meet you and talk to you. Thank you so much, Terry. It's been my pleasure to be here. Whoa. Oh, my God. Hold on a second. Uh, uh, thank you for doing that. All right. It was great. Thank you. Glad to talk to somebody that actually knows what I'm about. You know, <laughs> it, it makes a big difference. It makes it much more interesting rather than somebody go, well, tell me about yourself. Tell me who you are. <laughs> you know, like, uh... <laughs> um, have a great uh, summer. Uh, I hopefully we'll see you in some of the festivals. Uh, any, any, any bookings for the Canadian festivals? Actually, I'm going to do some Canadian shows in a festival, but I can't think of what the name of it is, with a, a, a band called Blue Moon Marquee. Oh, yeah. I just co-produced their new album that's not out yet, but it's coming out really soon. And um, I guessed it on their record, and I, uh, I helped out with production. And we had a lot of fun. They're great people. They've got a very interesting musical thing going on that's keep an uh, eye out i will keep an eye out for that thank you oh yeah that, that new album will be unbelievable take care of yourself wash your hands all right <laughs> <laughs> thank you good to see you thank you all right